shiur is uh, going to be about Shlomo Melech. It is Monday, September 29th. And uh, we're going to talk about, I wanted to talk about something about Yom Kippur, but I wanted to do a Nach shiur. But I said to myself, what can I talk about that's a Nach topic that relates to Yom Kippur, since Yom Kippur is only a few days away? And the thing that uh, occurred to me to, to focus on for tonight was an unusual occurrence in Sefer Melachim. This occurs in Sefer Melachim Perk Chet. And it's also mentioned in Divrei Yamim, Divrei Yamim Bet, Perk Zayn. Okay, and what happened was something very interesting. These two Prakim, now you know, I'm sure if you have a little experience with Tanakh, that Sefer Melachim and Divrei Yamim, Divrei Yamim is called in English Chronicles. Okay, Divrei, uh, Sefer Melachim is called Kings. These two books are parallel to one another. They run parallel to one another, meaning that much of what is in Sefer Melachim is repeated, oftentimes with variations of all kinds, in Divrei Yamim. And one of the big interpretive challenges of both books is trying to either reconcile them or understand how they are complementary uh, or parallel views of the same set of events because they don't always seem to match up on the details. Uh, Oren talked about that a little bit in his Nachshi or on uh, Shabbatot. He's been talking about that issue, that problem. So that's not necessarily the problem we're going to get into today, although there is an example of that in this example, but that's only, it's peripheral to what we're going to talk about. Now, what, what, what this is actually, this is one of the Haftarot of Sukkot as well. It says, kol ish Yisrael Unfortunately, we've lost most of the names of the Hebrew months. The names of the months that we use today are Babylonian in origin. The names like Tishrei, Mar Cheshvan, uh, Adar, Nisan, these are Babylonian names. There, there's a Ramban in Chumash that talks about how whenever the Jews went through a process of exile and redemption, they adjusted the calendar to reflect that. So when they left Mitzrayim, they called every month by its, its uh, relative position compared to the Yitziat Mitzrayim, leaving Egypt. So the first month is the first month they left Egypt. The second month is the second month that they were out of Egypt. The third month is the third month, and so on. And when they left Babylonia to come back to Israel, they again adjusted the calendar, so they used Babylonian months. Interesting. But anyway, Yera Ha'etanim is apparently the name of the month of Tishrei, or it was the name of the month, when the Jewish people had their own names for the months. But normally, the Torah simply re- refers to Chodesh Hashivi'i, the seventh month, as the month of Tishrei. It says, Bechag. What's Chag? What's Chag? When we say Bechag, what do we mean? In the, ho- the holiday. What's the holiday in Tanakh? Not just any holiday, but Chag. Not Rosh Chodesh. Not Pesach. Sukkot is always called Chag. It's the quintessential holiday. It's the most joyous, the most celebratory of all the holidays. It's the one where the Torah says not just for one day to celebrate at the Beit HaMikdash, but all seven days to celebrate, followed by an eighth day. So it's the greatest joy. It's Zman Simchatenu, the time of our joy. So it is the quintessential, the de- very definition of Chag is Sukkot. So whenever the Talmud refers to Chag, or the Navi talks about Chag, it's referring to Sukkot. So it says, they were, uh, it was Chag, Hu Achodesh HaShivii, which is the seventh month. Tishrei is the seventh month. If you're going by the calendar of Yitziat Mitzrayim, then it's the seventh month. Vayavoko Zikneh Yisrael, Vayisua Kohanim Aron. All of the elders of Israel came and the Kohanim lifted up the Aron. They're going to put it into the newly formed. This is the dedication of the first temple in times of Shlomo Melech. So what we're going to see is that they move the Aron, they move the Ark, which is, was made famous by Indiana Jones, of course, right? We, we, into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. This is what the, the Kohanim are doing as part of the, of the dedication. Now, anytime there's a space on this sheet, it means dot, dot, dot. It means that I didn't write all the Pesukim, I skipped a few Pesukim. Sometimes many. It says, That all that you have in the Aaron 
are the two tablets which Moshe Rabbeinu placed in there, which which contained the uh, the Brit, the Shakarat Hashem of Bnei Israel, but Tetam Eretz Mitzrayim, which Hashem made a covenant with Bnei Israel when they left Egypt. What happened? As soon as the Kohanim took the Aaron and they placed the Aaron with the two tablets inside the Kodesh HaKodeshim, they walked out. And what happens? Suddenly, Suddenly, a divine cloud fills the space, fills the Kodesh HaKodeshim, fills the whole area. The Kohanim could not stand to serve. It doesn't mean they couldn't stand it, meaning they were repulsed by it. What I mean is they couldn't stand. They couldn't go in. Because the cloud filled it and they weren't, they weren't able to enter. Because of this divine cloud. This is the same thing that happened when the Mishkan was dedicated. Remember, when the Mishkan was dedicated, the cloud came. Moshe Rabbeinu, and they couldn't go in. Nobody was able to go in at first. Okay? Now, same thing happens here, that they weren't allowed, they weren't able to enter. Okay, now as Amar Shlomo Hashem Amar Dishkon Barafel, so then Shlomo Amelech begins his long tefillah, his very very famous tefillah, which it, which begins Hashem, you have spoken, you have said that you will dwell in dark cloud. In other words, you will be a mystery to us, and yet. I have built for you an eternal house. And of course, Shlomo HaMelech goes on to say, if the heavens and the universe cannot contain God, how can this little house that I created contain God? Obviously it can't. It's not meant to be a house for God, literally. Hashem doesn't dwell on earth. Then it says, And at the end, Shlomo HaMelech blesses the entire people. At the end of his tefillah. So this, I, the reason why I put these excerpts will become clear to us as we proceed. But so far all we know is that the Beit HaMikdash was dedicated and there was a prayer from Shilamo. Then it talks about Vayizvach Shilamo Zevach Shilamo Asher Zevach Lashem. Shilamo HaMelech brought all kinds of sacrifices to God. It describes them. Bayom ahu kidesh HaMelech etoch achatzer shilafnei Beit Hashem ki asa sham et ha'ola ve'et ha'mincha ve'et chalvei ha'shilamim. So it talks about how there was such a surplus of korbanot that not only were they burning korbanot on the altar itself, they were burning them on the floor of the courtyard because they didn't have enough space for all the korbanot. It was an over, overflow of korbanot. Okay. Now in the now you'll see in the bold. Vayas shelamo ba'it ahiyat achag. At that time, Shlomo Melech celebrated the holiday. What ho, what's the holiday again? Sukkot. And that's and what happened? V'chol Yisrael imok al gadol mil bochamat nachal mitzrayim lefnei Hashem elohenu shivat yamim v'shivat yamim arba asar yom. There were seven days and seven days. Meaning, seven days before Sukkot, they were celebrating the dedication of the Beit HaMikdash. Then the seven days of Chag, of Sukkot. And then, by Yom HaShemini, what's the eighth day? Shemini Yatzeret, of course, right? Shilach et Am, he sent them home, and he gave them a blessing, and they went home very happy. Okay? So what we find is now, it's clearer, by the way. Here, you could fudge the psukim and say, well, maybe it's not really saying that the seven days were the seven days before Sukkot. In Devrei Ayamim, it explicitly says that the way it worked was seven days of dedication and then the seven days of Sukkot. And then the eighth day, which it says was Shmini Atzeret, he told everybody they could go home. Now, what's the problem? Okay. Right, so the problem is that one of the seven days before Sukkot is Yom Kippur. <laughs> Because after all, Yom Kippur is the 10th of Tishrei, and Sukkot is the 15th. So if we go back 7 days, 14th, 13th, 12th, right, 11th, 10th, 9th, 8th, you're going to end up going back, and including, right, you're going to go all the way, it's not going to go all the way back to Rosh Hashanah, right, but it's going to, it's going to start before Yom Kippur, that's for sure. Right, so, it, so definitely, it's going to have to include Yom Kippur, if you count back. So the question, of course, is how could there be seven days of dedication of the Beit HaMikdash and then seven days of Sukkot without running into the problem of Yom Kippur? It doesn't say, oh wait, we'll stop these Shilamim. Now remember, a Korban Shilamim is a Korban that's eaten by everybody. So what Shlomo Melech was actually doing was he was offering these Korbanot, he was offering these Shilamim and then distributing them to all the people who were eating them. How could he have done that for seven days? He didn't notice that it was Yom Kippur? He made a seven-day party and he forgot to check the calendar. It seems impossible. And if you look, so if you look down a little bit further, the second version of the dedication adds a detail. After Shlomo finished praying, 
It says that a fire came down from heaven and consumed the korbanot. And then it says that the, honor, the glory of God filled the house, which we can assume means the cloud that we heard about before filling the house, right? It adds the idea of the fire coming down, and it says that every, all the Jews bowed down, and they were thanking God for this great miracle of the dedication of the, of the Beit HaMikdash. But, not, but the main problem that we need to understand, now the Abar Benel goes into a whole thing. Why doesn't it mention in Sefer Malachim anything about the fire coming down? Why does it only mention that in Divrei Yamim? It's a very good question. He goes into a whole question about what is the what does Kavod Hashem mean? Okay. These are other details. The big question for us is what happened to Yom Kippur? So I actually saw somebody wrote an article, which I thought was a daft article, my personal opinion. Uh, you know, and you can quote me on that, saying that Shlomo Melech was such a you know, a bad guy that he didn't care about Yom Kippur if it interfered with his, you know, dedication to Beit HaMikdash. and since Sukkot fit into his agenda, he celebrated it. No, but I really don't think that's true. Could you imagine? We know how seriously Yom Kippurim is taken in the, in in, uh, the, in Jewish communities today. Even the most re- you know removed Jews have most of them have a connection to Yom Kippur. It's difficult to imagine that such a holy day would simply be brushed aside for a party. Now the Talmud, Babylonian Talmud, Moed Katan. Daftet Amur Aleph deals with this problem, which, by the way, all the Mefarshim deal with it. The Rabag talks about it. The Radak talks about it. Everybody speaks about it. The Radak, the Ralbag, and the Abar Benel all give two possible answers to the problem. Pro- possible answer number one is the Pshat answer is the simplistic, if you will, answer is that maybe, maybe they didn't, they really stopped for Yom Kippur. It doesn't mention that they stopped for Yom Kippur, but it's implicit that they stopped for Yom Kippur. It doesn't have to mention it. Or maybe they offered the sacrifices on Yom Kippur, part of the dedication of the Beit HaMikdash, but they didn't eat them. They waited until Motzei Yom Kippur, like we do for a Brit Milah, for example. Brit Milah, you do the Brit Milah on Yom Kippur, but you can't eat on Yom Kippur, so you wait until Motzei Yom Kippur, and then you have to have the meal. Don't think you're getting away with not giving the meal. Right? We're not going to let you get away with it, right? You still have to do it. It's just Motzei Yom Kippur, but you can't, you have to do the breed on the day. So what the Ralbag, Radak, and Abarbanel all say is one possibility is that he didn't, he didn't, they weren't eating the Korbanot on Yom Kippur. It just doesn't mention, yeah, that day they brought the sacrifice, they ate at night. Okay. That's one possibility. The Gemara doesn't give that possibility. The Gemara gives us an unbelievable interpretation. Okay. An interpretation that is going to be shocking. It's scandalous. If a rabbi got up and said this today, he would be in danger of losing his job. Let's do it. But there's a lot of things like that in the Talmud and Midrash. There's so many things like that in the Talmud and Midrash that if the rabbi, a rabbi got up and said it today, he would be get a pink slip at, on his door, you know, get out of here by the next day. Now, what's the, uh, what, what does uh, Rabbi Parnach say? Amar Rabbi Yohanan. Otashana, lo asu yisolet yom kippurim. They decided, you know what? No Yom Kippur this year. This year. Right, just this year. The Radak and the Ralbag say it would be based, or, and the Abar Benel, they all three say, according to this view, it was Al Pihora at Navi. Obviously, they had some prophet, some authority that instructed them that they did not have to observe Yom Kippur that year. It wasn't that they just got up in the morning and said, you know, Yom Kippur is totally cramping our style. We're having a great time at this party. Let's do it next year. Uh, the, the, no, a Navi obviously came and instructed them such. Who was the Navi? So the Navi at the time would be Natan the Navi. Yeah. Also that Orwell too in my Yeah, so they had ways of, of Hashem, you know, giving okay. them the okay. Yeah, so nobody says that everybody just sort of decided randomly, you know, we should, we should, maybe we should skip Yom Kippur. Um, but let's see what happened. Vayu Doagim. They were actually worried about this. The Omrim Shemanit Hayavu Sonehem Shal Yisrael Kelaya. Maybe the Sonehem Shal Yisrael is a euphemism in the Talmud. The Gemara does not Chas Shalom ever want to say that the Jews would be worthy of destruction or that good people would be. So it always says Sonehem Shal Yisrael. Maybe those who hate the Jews were worthy of destruction because they don't even want to say the idea that the Jews. So, but really, what it means is maybe God forbid we are worthy of destruction because we didn't observe Yom Kippur. Could you, I don't think there's ever been, aside from this, a Yom Kippur in the history of the thousands of years that we have the Torah that, that it wasn't observed at all. You know, we don't know what would happen if that happened, but it never happened. We don't have to work. So, uh, so, Yatzta Batkol Ve'amra, Ve'amra Lahem, 
כולכם מזומנים לחיי העולם הבא. Don't worry, you're all going to Olam Haba. So, so, the, so there's a couple of questions here. First of all, it's one thing to say it's okay. Don't worry about it. First of all, why did they not observe Yom Kippur? Why couldn't they just say, okay, we won't eat the Korban until night time? And number two, all right, we understand it was, maybe they had a heter, right? Let's say a, a, a person is ill. They have to violate Yom Kippur. They get, the rabbi tells them, they have to. We don't say, therefore, you're going to go to Olam Haba. <laughs> but, but what is that? Maybe not. Maybe yes, maybe no, but it has nothing to do with this. You have to follow halacha. The same halacha that says that you have to fast on Yom Kippur also says that there are certain situations where you're not allowed to fast on Yom Kippur because it's a danger to your life. But either way, you're keeping the mitzvah of Yom Kippur. In one case, you're keeping what the halacha says, that you observe Yom Kippur, you observe the Torah by not fasting. That's the rule, that's what you have to do. People who fast, even when they're halachically prohibited in fasting, are not really following halacha. They're not, they're not really following halacha. They're following their own religion, which is not the Torah. The Torah says if a person's life is in danger, they are not to fast. That's it. So if they fast, they're not following God. They're not following Hashem. They're doing Avera. So, so that, that just you know, it's important to realize that when you do, when you save a person's life on Shabbat, you're not violating Shabbat. If you didn't do it, you're violating what Hashem says. Right? That's you know, you have to think that way. That's why it says if somebody needs to be saved on Shabbat, you know who should call the ambulance? The rabbi should call the ambulance. You know who should turn on the light? The rabbi should do it. So everyone sees it's not something that we do. Because, oh, you know, we really shouldn't be doing this, but, oh, I guess we really, maybe we should think about it some more. No, it's something that you need to do. It's just to save somebody's life. So, here, you know, so if somebody does that, we, don't, we, we know they did the right thing. You know, I knew an, an emergency room doctor said, do you know what the highest incidence of Jews coming to the emergency room is? Motzei Yom Kippur. Because all of these people had heart condition, they had diabetes, they had all these things, and they insisted on fasting, and they almost die every year. It's not, uh, not the right way. So, but fine, they followed the halakha. But does that mean we should say to them, now you're going to Olam Haba? No! It means they don't have to worry that they ate on Yom Kippur for whatever reason. We'll see why. But it doesn't, it's not any special zechut. So we have to understand. So then the Gemara says, how did they know? What was the drasha that they made in the Pesukim to allow them to, uh, to eat on Yom Kippur? So it says, well, when it came to the Mishkan, She'en kiddushato kiddushat olam. The kiddushah of the Mishkan was only temporary. It lasted for hundreds of years, but it wasn't forever. And yet when they dedicated the Mishkan, you'll remember that the Nisi'im brought sacrifices for 12 days, right? For the dedication of Chanukah Tamizbeach, that we read on Chanukah. Right? So, each, so each of the 12 days, and one of those 12 days is obviously Shabbat. Has 12 days ever fought, passed without a Shabbat? Obviously not. Right? So they brought a korban on Shabbat, even though it's a korban yachid, it's an individual korban of a nasi. It's not a communal korban, it's not part of the Shabbat korbanot, you can't do that on Shabbat. Even in the times of the Beit HaMikdash, you can't bring any korban on Shabbat, only one that's for Shabbat. It wasn't for Shabbat, it was individual. And Shabbat is stricter than Yom Kippur. You know, it's a secret, don't tell anybody. Everybody thinks if they find out that Shabbat is more strict than Yom Kippur, they won't keep Yom Kippur either. <laughs> you know, don't tell them. You know, you know, you know, Shabbat is stricter than Yom Kippur. So, and yet, Yom Kippur, so, so Shabbat they violated for the dedication of the Mishkan. The dedication of the Mishkan is only on an individual, an individual on the sea brought a korban. He brought it on Shabbat, which is more strict than Yom Kippur. And it was done for something where the Kiddushah was only temporary. And yet that was okay. So here we have a permanent Kiddushah of the Beit HaMikdash. We have a Korban Sibur, because all of these Shilamim were being brought on behalf of the community. They weren't Shilamo Amalek's personal Korbanot. And, it's, and Yom Kippur is only Anosh Karet. Okay, that's still pretty bad. Right? The punishment is Karet. It's a terrible punishment, but it's not as bad as Shabbat. Shabbat is a death penalty. According to the Torah. Of course, they never gave it, but in, you know, that, that's what's on the books for, for Shabbat. So, it's more strict. So it says, Ela amai hayu doagin. So if they had such a great drasha, right? It's good logic. So why be worried? Why be worried if you have good logic? Good logic saves the day. Right? The, the Gemara always says, if I have svara, if I have good logic, why do I need a pasuk even? I have good logic. Good logic is a halachically valid. 
So the Gemara says, because they were still worried, because Hatam Tzorch Gavoa, Hachat Tzorch Hediot. Because over there, the korbanot that those Nisi'im brought were purely korbanot that were burnt. Right? They were purely burnt. But when it comes to these korbanot, they were Tzorch Hediot. They were eating the Shlamim. They were eating them. They were enjoying it. They were partying. Yes, it was a korban, but it was a party. So therefore, it was, they felt worse about it. So then the Gemara asks, Hachanami, me'avad le'avdu, me'chal lo nechlu, velo lishtu. So then, okay, if they, were so, if they felt so guilty about eating and drinking it, I have a very good solution. What the Abar Benel says, what the Rabag says, what the Radak says, is the Pshat. Offer the korban and don't eat it until the fast is over. If you're feeling guilty only about the eating part, so fine. If you say that it's equivalent to the Mishkan in every way, so it was okay that they brought the Korban. It just wasn't okay that they ate it. So fine, save the eating for tomorrow, for tonight. Why does it have to be on the day? So the Gemara says, no, because... In simcha Okay, they said because there's, it's not going to be a celebration then. The whole point of these Korban, no. The whole point of the sacrifice is that it should be a day of celebration. How's it going to be a day of celebration? If they don't eat and drink the, the stuff. So they had to eat and drink. So they were conflicted. They said, on one hand, we realize we have to do this. But on the other hand, you know, it's Yom Kippur. It's Yom Kippur. So halachic justifications notwithstanding, you know. And it, but again, we have to ask. So when it comes to a korban, okay, very nice. It had to be offered on that day. It had to be offered each day. A korban, just like the dedication of the original Mishkan, every day a sacrifice had to be brought. What? But the fact that they had to make it a party is a reason to eat on Yom Kippur? But they were worried because they felt, hey, here we're eating the korban. That's not so good. We're eating and drinking. Okay, so don't eat and drink. No, 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 it has to be a party. Why does it have to be a party? Save the party for after. Why did it have to be a celebration? That's a good question, right? I mean, the question is stronger than the answer. In this case. Or so it would seem. And then not only are they told... Not only are they told that it was okay what they did, they're told, now you're all going to go to Olam Haba. That's pretty nice. For eating and drinking on Yom Kippur. I'm pretty sure if you told anybody that, they would be more than happy to oblige. <laughs> that they would automatically get a ticket into Olam Haba just for eating on Yom Kippur. No problem. That's what he says. And then there's another interesting thing here, which is, uh, you know, it talks about uh, uh, that they were very happy when they went home. But um, the... Uh, 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 something perhaps we'll come back to but the, the, the question is how do we understand this? what is going on here? so the Gemara is convinced that these seven days uh, of Shilamo's dedication were days when the uh, when, when Yom Kippur you know when eating and drinking and partying happened on every day including Yom Kippur and they were a little bit uh, perhaps hesitant or worried about doing that but in the end they did it and it was the right thing not only was it the right thing it was an amazing thing that they ate and drank on Yom Kippur Okay. Now, we have to understand why. Where is this coming from? What can we understand here? Can we understand something about the nature of Yom Kippur or about the nature of the dedication of the Migdash or the Mishkan that will help us understand why this makes any sense? Because frankly, on the surface, it doesn't seem to. So let's take a look. We need, in order to understand this better... Yes? Sorry, I don't know if you discussed this earlier, but why couldn't they just postpone the inauguration to avoid this whole conflict? Well, the... There's a reason which is more related to Sukkot, why the dedication had to be adjacent to Sukkot. And why, why did it have to be seven days? Right, and why it had to be seven days. So they give reasons for the number seven is very significant, why it had to be number seven. That will take us a little bit off the beaten path, and I want to make sure that we get the essential point here. But the Mefarshim actually talk about that. Why did it have to be seven days and then another seven? Why did it have to be adjacent to Sukkot? There was a reason that has to do with the connection of Sukkot to the Beit HaMikdash, which is a, a very fundamental connection, which, which on Sukkot we can have a shiur about. Because there's a lot of good material about that too. But let's take a backtrack for a second. In order to understand this, we need to go to the, to the, to the source. We need to go back to the basics. And the basics are the original mitzvah of Yom Kippurim. Okay, let's take a look. Let's dip back in. Did you need a sheet? We have sheets. I think they're in the middle of the table. Could, could we bring a sheet over here? Thank you. Um, I see you sitting with that. Thank you. 
um, there might be more if you don't have. Um, so, Vaydaber Hashem al Moshe Achare Mot Shene Bnei Aharon BeKorvatam Lefnei Hashem Vayamutu. This is the Torah reading for the for Yom Kippur. I was going to say the first day of Yom Kippur. There's only one. For Yom Kippur, right? The, that Hashem spoke to Moshe after the deaths of the two sons of Aharon. Now, of course, everybody can ask, well, I mean, what is the connection between that and Yom Kippur? That's kind of a morbid way to kick off Yom Kippur. Hold on to that thought. Speak to Aaron, your brother. Tell him, don't come at any old time into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. Right? Or he'll die. Okay? Literally, it means, you know, lest he will die. Right? Ki be'anan era'el kaporet Because in a cloud, I shall appear on the kaporet. The kaporet is the cover of the ark. Okay? Bezot Aaron el kodesh And then it goes on to describe all of the elaborate rituals that enable Aharon to go into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. One of the things I'm going to talk about on Thursday when we talk about the Avodat Yom Kippurim in depth because I want people to understand the Musaf and how important it is and what the symbolism is of the Yom Kippur Avodah that we spend two hours reciting on Yom Kippur um, is we're going to go into the mystery of why it presents, why the Torah presents the service of Yom Kippur as if it's all about Aharon going into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. It's all an elaborate ritual to allow him to go in. It has nothing really to do with the Jews until the end. Um, that's, that's a whole other discussion but what's interesting here is the idea of the cloud because a cloud doesn't always appear in the Kodesh HaKodeshim, it only sometimes does right and but that cloud we noticed when, when is, what occasion did it appear in the dedication of the Beit HaMikdash right, because it said that Shalom, nobody could go in when they put the Aron into the, into the Mikdash all of a sudden a cloud descended and filled the entire Beit HaMikdash and nobody could go in Always there. No, it wasn't always there, and then it. The, the, the cloud wasn't always there. They could go. Uh, well, in the Mishkan times, it hovered over the Mishkan, but it wasn't inside because the otherwise they couldn't work. And the Beit it wasn't always there. Right after the Sukkot party, it left. Yeah, it left. It left. It, it, it went away. It, it was a sign that the divine presence was going to dwell in that place, and then it went away so that they could work. Okay, but is. but remember, what's the key avodah that the what does the kohen gadol do when he goes into the kodesh kodeshim? He puts the ketoret, and what is the ketoret supposed to do? It's supposed to make a cloud. Anana ketoret, the chisa anana ketoret the takaporet. That the 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 anana ketoret, the cloud of the ketoret is going to cover the covering of the ark, which is exactly what Hashem's cloud does. In other words, what is he doing? He's making a simulation of. The cloud of Hashem. Just like we make a simulation of the shofar gadol of, uh, of Mahar Sinai by blowing a shofar. They made a cloud to symbolize the divine presence cloud that would appear there. And he waits till the cloud fills that room and then he exits, right? That's what he's supposed to do. That's what it says in the Abu Dhabi when we read the Abu Dhabi Musaf. So, that, that's an important principle because what that shows you is that he, what he's really recreating in essence is what event? What event is the Kohen Gadol recreating on Yom Kippur? Inauguration. The original inauguration of the Mishkan. Okay, that is what it's about. And then if we skip down several psukim, the la Kodesh, we will atone for the holy, meaning for the Mikdash, mitumot b'nei Israel, from the impurities of b'nei Israel, or mipishehem nechol chatotam, and for their rebellions and all of their errors and so shall you do for the tent of meeting that dwells amongst you in the midst of your impurity in other words you are purifying you are giving a you are putting pushing the reset button on the mishkan we realize that any mode of worship that we have any mitzvah that we do any service of God that we do is somewhat, for lack of a better word, uh, tainted a little bit because we're human beings. We have all of our own intentions. We have all of our own kavanot. We have all of our own imaginations. We have all of our own fantasies. We have a very limited understanding of Hashem, if any, very limited understanding. So, of course, our service of Hashem is a limited Bidi avad, if you will, you know, kind of service. We're human beings. We're in a process. Nobody can say that a 13-year-old bar mitzvah boy putting on tefillin is the same as a 30-year-old who understands what he's doing, or a 50-year-old who studied in depth the meaning of tefillin. It's impossible. Mitzvot, and, and even that person will say there's a depth to the mitzvah that I don't grasp. 
when we blow the shofar, we read that whole long prayer for the tokea. I don't understand what I'm doing. I have no idea what the meaning is. You know, we, we don't comprehend uh, a fraction of what we're doing. So, because we don't understand Hashem. So how could, and, and, and it's, a, it's an expression of Hashem's wisdom. So by definition, we're not going to be able to fathom the totality of it. So that means we're doing it largely in ignorance. Our service of Hashem is always going to be a service based on limited understanding, a little bit of a distortion, a little bit of a, uh, a you know, a, sim- a simplistic understanding of what the mitzvah really is. It has to be. Every Shabbat that we observe is every Shabbat we observe with a complete, total understanding of what Shabbat is all about, what every halacha means, why it is all the way it is. Of course not. It takes years to get there, and even when you're there, there's more. So all of our avodat Hashem is limited. So we have to purify the Mishkan because our service of Hashem is tainted by our mortality, by our limited understanding, by our humanity. It's, you know, the fact that Hashem dwells amongst us is a concession to who we are. He accepts us for who we are. We're very thankful. But we don't want to delude ourselves into thinking that that means that how we are actually reflects a true understanding of God. That's a mistake many religions make. Many religions believe if you just have faith in a person hanging on a cross, you, that, that's, that's all there is. You have faith in it. That's, that's the, uh, and you're 100% good. You're going straight to the top. We don't have a belief like that. We believe that we're never finished with the process of understanding. We're always in the process. We always recognize our ignorance. Okay, so that is that is what the what the Torah is saying. You have to purify. You have to set the reset button every year, and then the adam lo Nobody is allowed to be in the Mishkan or in the Beit Hamikdash when the Kohen Gadol goes in for the service because he's creating the cloud. And what does it say when he creates the cloud at the inauguration of the Beit Hamikdash? Nobody could go in. So again, doesn't that show you that what the service of Yom Kippur is doing is recreating that moment of beginning? It's recreating them at the beginning. All right, now let's take a look. We go a little bit further down, and it talks about the atonement of the Jews that they're go, that they're going to have uh, they're going to uh, you know have to afflict themselves and also not do uh, any melacha. And then it says, on this day you'll be purified from all of your sins. And then it says that. That this returning to Hashem, focusing on the ultimate transcendence of God and recognizing our own humanity, our mortality, our frailty, our limitations, our deficiencies, our physicality, that is where the kapara comes from. In other words, the ultimate reality check of Yom Kippur is what cleanses us of all of our attachments to the petty things that hold us back from serving God. Of course, the minute Yom Kippur is over, we reattach all of them, you know, with, with very little delight. But um, maybe one or two rem- permanently remain uh, detached. That's the hope, right? As my teacher used to say, you take three steps forward and two steps back every Yom Kippur, and hopefully the one step you gain. So, the, um, so Yom Kippur is supposed to be this ultimate immersion in the spirituality of the day. That's why you need it every year. So you need every year. You need a continual return to this to try to immerse yourself and emerge a little bit cleaner, a little bit better. It's like a person who says, you know, I take a shower once a year whether I need it or not, right? You know, eventually they're going to get dirty again, but they take another shower. So we come back spiritually every year. We set the reset button on the Beit HaMikdash. We set the reset button on ourselves. The reset button on ourselves is a day of total dedication to God and a day of dissociating from the Yetzirah. Like we talked about when we talked about the Agadah of the Satan in the Gemara when we did that class on the Satan. That, the, that, that being able to distance yourself from the Yetzirah allows you to think about it objectively. You're not in the grasp of it. And true, it's going to go right back into you as soon as Yom Kippur is over. But you have a day of really reflecting on it and really seeing the truth. Having a day of truth, a moment of truth. It's very powerful. So that's what, that is what the Yom Kippur day is supposed to accomplish. And we can now see that the idea of Yom Kippur is a reset. It's a reset on the service of God. But now let's take a look at the dedication of the Mishkan, the last piece here. It says that Aharon came down and he blessed the people. Now who did we see bless the people earlier? Of course, this is an opposite chronological order that we're stepping, right? You realize, because we started with Shlomo. Then we went to after the deaths of Aharon, and now we're going to the day of the actual dedication of the Mishkan, when Aharon blesses the people. Who blessed the people in Sefer Melachim? Shlomo Amelech, who was the dedicator at that time, right? So here we have Aharon doing these dedicative things after he does the Korbanot, and he blesses the people. And then what happens? 
Moshe and Aharon go into Ohel Moed and they come out again and then the glory of God appears. A fire comes from before Hashem and consumes all of the Korbanot. Everybody celebrates and falls on their face and bows down. Does that sound familiar? Well, yes, but of course it's what happened first, right? What happened first was the Mishkan. That this fire comes down, the glory of God fills the Mishkan, which is the cloud again. The fire comes down to consume the Korbanot. This is exactly what happened in the times of Shalomu HaMelech. The people are all bowing and celebrating. Vayaronu. They were set, they were happy. Just like it says that they were all bowing and happy and saying, Praise God, Hodu Lashem Kitov, we're so happy. When the, when, the, uh, when the divine presence reveals itself. And then it says, Nadav and Avihu bring their Esh Zarah, they make their mistake, they go in and a fire comes. Just like it says, Vatitza Esh Melefne Hashem, a fire comes out and consumes the Korbanot. It says, Vatitza Esh Melefne Hashem, Vatochalotam. The fire comes out and eats them, just like it ate the Korbanot. And then Moshe says, this is what Hashem said, Bikrovai Ekadesh. In other words, their death becomes a part of the inauguration of the Beit HaMikdash. It becomes a part of the consecration of the Beit HaMikdash because the whole idea of the Beit HaMikdash is the absolute transcendence of Hashem. The whole idea is the absolute transcendence of Hashem and our, and our need to have a boundary between us and Hashem. We can't feel that we are buddy-buddy with Hashem. I don't know if I ever told you, I probably did, that I used to have, some of you have heard this before, that I used to have these um, Jehovah's Witnesses that would come to my door every, sh- every other Shabbat. I told you? Oh every other Shabbat. And I, being a nice guy, you know, would always let them come in, give them tea, sit with them, talk. They would talk for me for hours. They used to come every other Shabbat till I, I was living there for like, I don't know, a couple of years it would come. And even after I moved to a new house, they followed me. They looked me up. They actually followed me to the next, uh, next address. And uh, they would sit down and they would bring different people every week. Like after a while, one team was getting like worn out. So they brought like some guy from the home office, some big wig, I don't know from where, to uh, try to talk to me. And so one of the things that they, one of their arguments was, you know, you Jews, you don't use Hashem's name. Why don't you just call Hashem what, like we do? You know, they're called Jehovah's Witness. That's not really Hashem's name, but that's what they think it is. So they, you know, so that, but they, they uh, they say, why don't you call, you know, your, your, Hashem is your father, Hashem is your, is your friend, Hashem is, you know, why don't you speak to, why, why don't you speak to him directly, why do you call him Hashem? And, you know, they're very creative in their outreach, because for every religion, they have a pamphlet that's de- designed for that religion. So for Jews, they have it, like, it looks like a page of Talmud. And it quotes Rashi, it quotes Jewish commentaries in their uh, thing. Because they want, uh, they, it quotes a Mishnah, Gemara, and it talks about, you know, Jews, they don't say God's name, they think it's a terrible sin to say God's name, or even say the letters of Hashem's name, the, the four letter name. And so he asked me, why don't you say Hashem's name? He's your friend, he's your father, he's this. I said, really? I said, let me ask you a question. Do you, say your fa- do you call your father by his first name? Would you call your father by his first name? He said, no, of course not. I said, well, I'm going to call uh, Avinu Sheba Shamayim by his first name. If you wouldn't call your own father, human father by his first name, how can I call HaKadosh Baruch Hu by his first name? He's a, you know, it doesn't make any sense. So anyway, the, uh, so Hashem here is setting the tone. In other words, so in a way, the deaths of Nadav and Abihu, they become part of the point. Part of the, the point is, there is, an, there is a presence of God here. There's an absolute transcendence. And there's a boundary. There's a limit on us. Where does the limit come from? The fact that we are physical. The fact that we are material beings. The fact that we are deficient beings. That's where it comes from, the limitation in our relationship with God. That's what the Rambam says. He says, why can't human beings understand God ultimately? Because no matter what we do, we're still physical beings. We're still, even Moshe Rabbeinu, he's still physical beings. There's never going to be absolute purity in our understanding of, of the truth as long as we're encased in the physicality. And so that's the idea that Nadav and Avihu thought they could spring ahead from their religious ecstasy and commune with God. But it doesn't work like that. You have to be careful where you tread, where you place your feet. And that's, that's the, the message that they get. Now, the interesting thing is that we kind of symbolize the idea of Nadav and Avihu as well, we have the Avodah of Yom Kippur, which recreates the inauguration of the Beit HaMikdash. And we also have the fasting, which in a way recreates Nadav and Avihu, doesn't it? Because what are we really being on Yom Kippur? We're being purely spiritual. We're being Malachim. We're experiencing, in a way, death. Like a lot of the Mepharshim say, what is Yom Kippur supposed to be? It's supposed to be a, an experience of death in this world. No eating, no drinking, no physicality. It's like what Olam Haba is going to be like. In other words, you're experiencing uh, your, your complete removal of the physicality. And so, that, and it's supposed to remind you of that mortality and remind you of that aspect of yourself. So in a way, we are doing both ends on Yom Kippur. 
we're having the inaugural part and we're having the sense of my physicality as the impediment as the limiter on my relationship with God so I get rid of it for that day I push it away for that day so I can see it for what it is I can recognize it for what it is but now we come back to our question so if all of this is true and Yom Kippur is a beautiful day it's very spiritual and inspiring so how could they eat and drink on Yom Kippur how could they do it and how could it not only be a mitzvah but it could get them into Olam Haba so what I'd like to suggest is that the difference between Yom Kippur and the, and, uh, the, the Yamim HaKippurim of the future and uh, the original dedication of the Mishkan is what? Is the presence. presence of the cloud, yes. The presence of the cloud is simulated in the future, in, in a regular Yom Kippur, right? But in the inauguration, it's a real, it's a real manifestation of the divine presence coming from on high, so to speak. And it's the beginning. It's, it's to establish something. In other words, to establish the divine presence in its home in the Beit HaMikdash. So in the dedication of the Mishkan, there was no fasting that day. They weren't fasting. The only reason it became a partially sad day was because Nadav and Avihu died. Otherwise, it was a day of joy. By Yarono, they were celebrating. The celebration is part of it. It's Ivdu et Hashem b'simcha. The divine presence, the appearance of the divine presence, it has to be received b'simcha. With, of course, it says, Vigilu bir adat, it says in Tehillim, uh, uh, right? You have to celebrate with trembling. What does that mean? You know your place, you know your boundary, you don't go into the Beit HaMikdash when the cloud is filling it, but the Gilo, you have to be celebrating, you have to be happy. So the joy is a component part of the welcoming of the Shekhinah into the Beit HaMikdash. You can't... Why weren't they fasting? So that one, that Yom Kippur, in the time of uh, when? The first. In the Mishkan or in the time of Shlomo HaMelech? Because the dedication of the Mishkan wasn't on Yom Kippur. It was just on an ordinary day. It was, uh, it was actually uh, Rosh Chodesh uh, Nisan. So it was an ordinary day. So they, so they weren't fasting. But, in, but the idea is that, sim, that when you're starting, in other words, when you're creating, when you're hitting the reset button on the Mishkan, or the reset button on the Avodah Tashem, so you have to fast. Because you have to clear, you have to, you have to use human means to clarify to regain that perspective. You have to have the service in the Beit HaMikdash that recreates the cloud with nobody going in. You have to have the, the fasting of the people to recognize where they stand and what their position is. But here you don't have that. Here you have the real Shekhinah. And so the only proper response to the real Shekhinah is Simcha. You have to rejoice with the presence of the Shekhinah. It can't be an occasion for sadness. It can't be an occasion for any kind of uh, uh, self-flagellation. So actually the Simcha of the Jewish people is a component part of enshrining the Shekhinah, if you will, in the Beit HaMikdash. It's setting up the very framework by which they're going to measure their closeness to God. Setting up the framework is not a day of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a day of resetting. It's a day when we have to reset. But when we're actually setting up, when we actually are on the level that we're receiving the Divine Presence, that day, it would be contradictory to have a day of Inui, to have a day of suffering. It has to be on that day that there's going to be Simcha. And, that's the, and so therefore the physicality, instead of being an impediment to the Jews... What is the simcha that they're experiencing on that day? That simcha is the vehicle that's consecrating the Beit HaMikdash. Their simcha in receiving the Divine Presence is what's... Conce- because it says that the, sh- the Shekhinah cannot be shorat unless on a person who is sameach. He has to be rejoicing for the Divine Presence to come. They won't be able to create the Beit HaMikdash without the Divine Presence coming down and without the joy that they have to feel that day. So their joy is actually the basis, the foundation on which the Beit HaMikdash is being built. That's why Hashem is saying, you overcame your natural inclination, which is to have to fast on Yom Kippur because you're thinking only about yourself and you're afraid that, oh, oy vey, if I don't fast on Yom Kippur, just like the people who don't fast, on, who are afraid of not fasting on Yom Kippur because when they're not supposed to, Right? But they feel guilty. They feel like it's something wrong. Hashem says, no, you're going to go to Olam Haba. Why? Because your joy on that day, the physical pleasure you were partaking of, that happiness was the very vehicle to bringing the Shekhinah into the Beit HaMikdash. To starting it all off. And that, you can't, that's not Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a reset. But, ex- but establishing, creating, there you need the Simcha. Yeah. So you're saying there was no fast because the Shekhinah was there. Right, exactly. But that's during, a, that's a, during the desert, mm-hmm. the Mishkan, you said the right. Shekhinah was, the cloud was with them. Right, but not in the Mishkan. 
It was the in the in the in the Beit Hamikdash in the Midbar. The cloud was like the led them. It would hover over the Mishkan and then lead them to different places. Did they? It wasn't in the Mishkan. Was Yom Kippur observed during the? It seems like yeah, it was. It seems like it was. Even though the because the re because they constantly had to re-establish, recreate that experience of the initial dedication. So if you think of Yom Kippur as a rededication of the Beit of our institution, that's why it always mentions that you're being mechaper on the institution. You're you're resetting the institution and resetting yourself. But when you're not resetting, but you're actually creating that relationship with the Shekhinah the first time, they're the only appropriate. Response is a response of simcha. So even though in the desert the Shekhinah was hovering over, it wasn't the still, inauguration of it. They exactly. still fasted, or they, they still went fasted. Through the steps of yeah, they still went through it for in, the. In this yeah. case, because the Shekhinah was actually in the bay. In the exactly, bay. it was the it was new because it was a new level. This was machon the shiftecha olamim. The first time they were having a permanent abode for the Shekhinah. So it was really a totally new level in the awesome evolution. That's yeah. That's why Shlomo Melech is saying, for since the beginning of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, Hashem never chose a place to be the permanent abode of the Shekhinah. It never happened until now. So it's really it is the culmination. Why does it keep mentioning Yitzhak Mitzrayim? Because it's the culmination of all that they've been through. In fact, when we did the Midrashim about Shlomo Melech with Bat Paro, that was the whole idea. It's supposed to be the culmination of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, but Shlomo Melech was too interested in Mitzrayim, right? He was going back in certain ways to Mitzrayim. That was his problem. But we're looking at the positive today. The positive is that that's why, in this case, Yom Kippurim gets reversed. Right? So it's beautiful because not only does it help us understand why they didn't... It helps us understand what Yom Kippur is about, as well as what it means to dedicate the Beit HaMikdash and to bring the Shekhinah into the world. So if in the future, although it says in the Gemara that the future Beit HaMikdash is going to be dedicated at the end of Nisan. So we're not going to have the opportunity... I'm sorry, no, it says it's going to be dedicated at the end of Tishrei. Right? So we're not going to have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to be able to miss a uh, Yom Kippur. Because it's going to be at the end, it's going to be after Sukkot. It says it's going to be after Sukkot. So the Mashiach is supposed to come in Nisan and then Tishrei uh, dedicate the Beit HaMikdash. So we won't get to miss Yom Kippur. Uh, but the uh, but what's beautiful about the story of Shlomo Amalek missing Yom Kippur is that when you really it leads you back to trying to understand what the essence of Yom Kippur is about, and then once you understand that, it can also enhance and deepen your experience of the holiday today. That what it's all about is hitting the reset button on our Avodat Hashem, on our institutions, on everything. Really considering where they go wrong because of our human fallibility, and trying to focus on what's really fundamental and really essential, and hopefully. After Yom Kippur, all of our communal institutions and all of our individual lives will emerge a little bit more aligned with the values and principles of Torah than they were before. That's the, that's the dream. That's the hope. Any other questions? Yes. The year of inauguration. Yeah. What about the Jews that were not present at the inauguration? Or all the Jews we are believing? It that sounds there? like they were all there. No Jews so were abroad. It's, it, the description sounds like everybody was there, but no, it was only the only the ones who were actually there would have been under that exemption for sure. It could have been that there were Jews that were abroad for yeah, it could be, reason. yeah. They were they keeping observed. it somewhere on a business trip, you know, and they During were keeping it. The the no, meaning they could have been traveling overseas for some other practical reason, and oh. therefore, you know, not actually at the event. When it, it describes it as being, you know, uh, when it describes it, it says, Kol Ish Israel. So it sounds like everybody was there, but you know they, they were not. They there. would observe. Oh, for sure. So it was the heter was because they were participating in this dedication. That was what gave it to them. Yeah.